coffee break hard to anyone who's watching live. Let me know if you can hear me well, if you can see me well, if you're watching live, especially the hearing part will be important. So if you can post a little comment, let me know how you are, I will be most grateful. My name is Zuzanna and I'm a harpist and harp teacher and this is my weekly video series. And today we're going live, every last Friday of the month will be live lesson. It used to be a live show every week, but now I'm experimenting with making videos. So every video, every week, you will see a new video updated to my channels. But because I miss the chat with you and the contact with you and hearing from you, I decided that once a month we will try to go back to the old format. Let me know what you think about this idea. We will, of course, see how it goes, how it works in practice. Um, I'll just quickly consult my notes to make sure that I don't forget to say anything. That's um, the advantage of the video, that we can always add things later. Um, hello to everyone who's joining in. Let me know if you can hear me. I see people joining in on Instagram, on Facebook. I'm still waiting to hear some comments. When you, when you decide to say something, please let me know how you are, how are you doing. While you're typing your answers, I'll just share with you a quick update on what's been happening here at Coffee Break Hard, Break Hard recently. Uh, thank you for the likes. It seems that everything works on Instagram. Hopefully everything works on Facebook too. So here at Coffee Break Harp, I've been fairly busy with setting up the new videos. It's been a lot of things to learn despite me working on them before. It's been still quite a lot of stuff to learn and to make happen. But as I'm making more and more of that, I'm getting more experience. So I hope you like what you see. Uh, an important update for everyone, I know lots of people have been waiting for that episode and lots of people have been asking me to share some information on how to avoid playing, avoid pain when playing the harp, how to avoid excessive tension. So for anyone who's been waiting for that episode, it's already recorded and it's in the editing process. So hopefully next week or the week after that, there will be the first of the two episodes on that topic landing. So if you want to make sure you don't miss that, sign up to the newsletter. That will also allow you to download PDFs from today's episode and from all the previous episodes. So that was one thing. Let me tick that off from my list. Um, let me take a sip of tea. Just wondering what have you got with you today? Have you got tea or coffee? And if you want to share a picture of your favorite cup, please do. Mm. All right, next thing on the list. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, in the background, apart from making new videos, I am working on an online course and that will be dedicated especially to people who um, don't know yet how to read music when playing the harp. So that will be a gentle introduction on how to read music, specifically on the harp. I know that there is lots of content out there on music theory and there are even lots of apps on training to read music. I am working on designing something specifically for the harp and taking into account that challenge that we've got of having to look sort of sideways from the strings and then back to the strings, the challenge of reading two lines for two hands at the same time. So I'm working on something which will hopefully help many people who would like to play from music and find it a bit too challenging to manage learning a new instrument, new technique and music at the same time. I don't know yet the exact date, but I'm very much hoping this will be by the end of 2020. And if you want to hear more details or if you want to take part in tests, because I will be looking at some point for volunteers to run through some of the exercises with me, please sign up to the list. I will put a link in the description of this video to, for those of you who want to sign up and who would like to help me create as best course as possible. I can see that there are quite a few of you watching on Facebook. Let me know who are you and how are you today? Hello, Tammy and uh, hello, Kirsty. I think that's you that I see watching there. Uh, let me know how are you doing today? Okay, and that's another tick of the list about the course. If you are 
looking for harp lessons and are interested in study with me. I'm currently going to the end of the summer term and probably the next time I will be accepting new students will be beginning of August. There will be a bit of a summer break in July, so in August I'm going to most likely do a more intense course so for those of you who would like to have uh, more frequent than weekly lessons and I will be of course sharing some more updates about that and then a new regular course of lessons will be running from September again. Okay, so let's move on to today's topic. Uh, before, I, before we move on, I'll just check if anyone else commented. Hi Linda, hello to Manchester. It's very sunny in Edinburgh here as well. Um, I don't see any questions. If you want to ask anything, there will be some time at the end of this live for me to answer your questions, either about today's topic or anything else you want to ask, if you, if you have time. Um, and let's dive into what we were going to speak about today, because I know lots of people were looking forward to that. Okay, let me find the beginning of my notes. That's, by the way, the PDF that you can download for today. <laughs> it will be a bit nicer one without everything that I've written down here. <laughs> Hello. All right, so first, for those of you who are worried about the amount of mistakes that happen in the lesson compared to a practice room and frustrated by the number of hours, the number of hours that you've spent practicing and how perfectly you are able to play a piece from beginning to the end in a practice room and then things falling apart in a lesson. So first, this is absolutely normal and everyone is experiencing that, even professional musicians who possibly still go and see their teachers every now and then, as for example I do. Even for us, that can happen if we take a fresh piece which has just been learned, if we play it for the first time to anyone out there, we will be making mistakes that are different from the ones that we make in the practice rooms and we will be often surprised and often frustrated by that. And one other important thing, your teacher is aware of that, they know and they usually can't tell whether your mistakes come from lack of practice or whether they are the effect of you getting stressed. An experienced teacher will be able to tell a difference between those two types of a mistake, so please be aware that your teacher knows what it feels like. Um, then. This all is part of a learning process and mistakes are also part of a learning process and the fact that you make different mistakes when you practice on your own and then uh, something else happens when you take a piece to your teacher is a good thing because it allows you to pinpoint all the potentially insecure places which could fall apart when you will be playing piece under yet different circumstances for your family, friends or recording. So it's good to give your piece as much possibilities for exposure, so to say, as possible, because every time something different will come up. And I heard someone saying, I think that was a pianist saying, that when they perform a big new piece, they usually try to have at least 10 performance opportunities before they take that piece to a big concert hall. So you see, it's quite a long process, and that first time when you play a piece for your teacher is just one out of many to make the piece sound better. Um, luckily, it's possible to find your way around that and to adjust your practice habits so you try to work on making as few of those mistakes as possible. Some things are uh, ones that you can control in your practice room and we will get to that. Hello Vicky and good morning. Uh, to you as well. Beautiful Sally, Newfoundland and Labrador in Canada. Oh, how lovely. Hello to you. All right. Why does this thing happen? Why is it that um, we know something really well and then we can't repeat it in front of a teacher? So this has all to do, of course, with how our brain works. When we're at home and we are relaxed, the brain activity is as its normal, um, rather calm uh, wave. I don't know the exact names of the waves. I know that there are alpha waves and beta waves, but I'm not going to go too much into that because I'm not an expert in biological sciences. But anyway, what happens when you are in a lesson, your brain goes in a sort of overdrive mode, which um, it does if it senses some kind of a danger. That means that 
you will be processing information more easily. So it's as if you got a huge dose of caffeine suddenly injected into your brain. <laughs> to think about caffeine. Um, so this also means that you will be much more sensitive to any sort of information coming to your brain. You will be hearing more noises, you will be more easily distracted by them because of course when you're in danger you want to get every possible bit of information which is affecting your situation. Every sort of smell, visual cues will mean that you're more easily distracted. And even though this is um, an uh, evolutionary mechanism, now, nowadays, when we're not really in a physical danger, in a hard lesson, this is something that works against us. And uh, the only way probably is try to practice in a way that allows your brain to rehearse being in these kind of situations. And I will talk in a second about that. One way in which you can gently get used your brain to being in a slightly more alert state is to record yourself. Um, with audio or even better with a video. I think front-facing cameras are great so you not only are aware of something happening and you being recorded but you also see yourself which caters for that part of the brain which you know in the lesson is talking to you about what your teacher thinks about you and how do I look and all the things like that. So I think recording yourself is one great way to imitate that sense, that state of overdrive that your brain goes into. And I would try to do two types of recordings when you do that. I would definitely try to record a complete piece playing from beginning to the end, as if you would in a performance situation, and then watch it back, of course, see what happens. Then you don't have to keep that mental score of what went, what went wrong. This is one thing that you need to learn to let go of when you are playing a piece um, because everything is happening so fast. If you're thinking about the past mistake, you are going to make another one in the place where you are now. So having a recording device that is keeping track of all your mistakes means that your mind can focus on what's there. And it takes some time to get used to that, but if you work with a recording regularly, that will definitely be helpful. Another recording that you can do, which will also be very useful, is recording a larger chunk of your practice session, say 20 minutes, because then you can watch it back and see what kind of practice strategies are you most likely to use in your practice sessions. Do you play large chunks of music? Do you tend to play lots of uh, your pieces from memory, even though you're not quite, quite aware you've memorized that? We will get to that in a second. So. You, you can be quite surprised actually what kind of things you are doing in your practice and you may think that you were doing exercises for quite a long time but then it turns out that it was only five minutes out of 15 and so on. Both types of recordings are very interesting and very very helpful in making progress. I'll just check quickly what comments are you putting here. Harpe Bourgeois on Instagram says, my teacher always told me to kidnap other musicians in the corridors to have them hear a run through. Interesting, interesting, interesting topic, sorry. I think it was a French autocorrect. Yeah, please keep not kidnap people, not in a literally, literally sense, but try to have as many performing opportunities as possible. I will be talking a bit more about that. Now I hope that this won't go live anywhere and people will not accuse me of <laughs> encouraging to kidnap musicians. Um, this was a metaphor for your information. I'll have a look at comments on Instagram. Hello from Canada. Hello from Austra Australia. Uh, Tammy says that she skipped a whole bar yesterday during lesson, even when she was very familiar with the piece during practice. Yeah, that's another thing that can happen. And I think you will find what I'm going to say next quite useful. And then Vicky says, I do that a lot. I'm continue, continuing to play my piece, but I'm trying to determine what I did wrong in a measure three bars back. Yeah, it's very often that, especially when things are going really well, and then suddenly you get a mistake in a place where you didn't used to make mistakes ever, never. You just keep thinking about that. Why did it happen? It was going so well. And then you've got that mental chat going there, which is not helping to carry on with the task that you've got immediately on hand. Um, talking about missing bars and um, other potential memory slips, 
Um, what happens very often in our practice, uh, if you are uh, like me, you find memorizing quite easily, what happens very often is that you unconsciously memorize large chunks of piece while not quite being aware that you play from memory. And then you come into the lesson and you play, 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 and then you look back at the music and what you see there is not something that you expected. <laughs> so you have to stop and you have to find your way and and then by that time you are quite stressed probably so there are more mistakes ensuing. So to prevent that from happening, to make sure that your memory is helping you and not interfering in how you're playing, make sure that when you're learning a new piece from very early on, you put uh, rescue points, which I also call emergency exits, like those green arrows pointing to the exits. Make sure that you practice starting from those places and they should be um, quite frequently um, placed in your piece. So if you make a mistake in one bar, you can immediately jump to the next one and you will find it easy to start because you've practiced starting from that place. It's quite frequent that we start our practice from the very beginning and we play until the first mistake. So very often if we make a mistake in the first bar, we go back to the beginning. We can't skip to the second bar because we're not used to starting from there. And for later places in the piece, sometimes we don't even know where things are on the page. So practicing starting from very, very different places in a piece is a very good strategy. I also, I might post a picture of that later, but what I do, I write little numbers with arrows and then I try to start from those places and making sure that they are strategically placed. So I always know my pedal setup in that place and I know what it looks like on the page. I know where it is on the page. So that's something which is uh, very important. Then when you've learned the whole piece and you've got your emergency exits evenly scattered throughout the piece, what you want to do is keep track of what you have already memorized and what is not yet memorized. So you can uh, play whatever section you have memorized, then you know where you have to look back to the page and where that section is on the page, and then you can carry on playing whether from memory or with the music. Um, last but not least, even if you've memorized the whole piece, I think it's still very important that you play with music every now and then partially because we tend to forget some small markings like dynamics or other expressive markings and partially because I think it's quite important that you still remember where different sections are on the page in case you ever need to refer back to the music quickly or uh, for any other emergency situation that you need to handle. If you are working on memorizing a piece, I think one great thing that you can do is mental practice and I've done a whole video about that. I will put a link again in the description of this Facebook Live so you can check it out. Um, something that um, someone mentioned just before about kidnapping other musicians and make them listen to you, that's one next thing that I would like to talk about. You need to practice performing and putting yourself in that situation and making your brain go through those state of heightened activity with someone listening to you. So after you've tried a gentle introduction with recording yourself, the next step is to go to playing to actual people. Although it's absolutely fine to play for your pet, for your dog or for a cat. For a cat it might be a bit of a challenge because they usually seem quite disinterested, but you can have a go at playing at your cat if you like. You can play for your neighbor, you can play for your imaginary neighbor, imagining that they are listening to you. All of those will really help you when um, you will eventually be performing for more people. Another fun practice that you can do is practice become, uh, getting into a lesson situation. So what I would do is pack up all my music, put a coat, go outside the front door, come back, take my coat off, uh, put the music on the stand as if I was entering my teacher's studio and then play. I think you can have quite a lot of fun doing that. Even if you're having your lessons uh, remotely at the moment, I think it's quite a good exercise to just practice pretending that you're entering a different state of mind when you exit and come back and then pack music. So have some fun doing that. And finally, we're getting to the end of the PDF. 
The next step that you can do after practicing playing with a recording in front of somebody doing your mental practice, you can try to deliberately interfere with what you're playing. I suggest you only do that once your piece is at the high level stage where you can perform it confidently, possibly performing it from memory. And what I would do is turn on the TV, position yourself in front of the screen and then try to play through your piece, trying to focus as much as you can as what you're doing and what you're playing. Then you can make that more or less challenging by experimenting with turning the volume up or down, maybe putting on your favorite series, uh, maybe the episodes that you haven't seen yet. That can be all uh, very helpful for making sure that you're focused and in your practice zone, or whatever is happening. This TV is kind of imitating that mental chat that is going on in your head that is preventing you to focus fully on what you're doing right now. So practicing something like that with a distracting TV or laptop or anything else will help you to turn off, to tune out that mental um, buzz that is happening in the background when your brain goes into a heightened sensitivity mode. Um, I think professional harpists and possibly pianists may find that trick not so useful because if you play a lot on weddings or if you play a lot for uh, a lot of background music you're naturally used to playing where there's a lot going on in the in the background but if you have never been in that kind of situation that's a perfect practice especially if you're thinking about eventually getting some functions work and background work practicing with a tv can be a really good idea all right i got to the end of my notes now i'm wondering if you've got any questions about what I said? Is there anything that you would like me to say again? Or are there any particular situations that happened recently that meant that you were not as happy with your lesson as you could be? I'm just trying to see if I haven't missed any comments. Bianca says, I find it really helpful to listen to my recording done by heart, so from memory looking at the score. Yeah, looking at the score is another thing, watching yourself play and checking whether you're really doing what you think you're doing when playing the score is a great way. Listening to recordings of yourself in general and looking back at your progress is a great thing, so I would suggest maybe keeping an archive on your computer with folder where you've got a lot of your previous recordings and where you can refer back to them when you're revisiting an old piece or just to appreciate what you've done. Thank you for sending all the likes. I'm just checking if there's anything else. Um, I think we had a good time. I was worried that, we'll be, that it will be quite a long life, but I planned it for, for it to be under 30 minutes and I think we did pretty well. So if there are no more questions, also, hi, yes, hi, Bianca. If there are no more questions, we will finish here. Uh, remember to download your free PDF and subscribe if you want to hear about the next episodes coming up in June about uh, releasing your tension, Alexander Technique, and other tips to avoid injuries when playing the harp. Um, and I will see you next week. Some, some more questions. Do you have any videos on using iPad for music? Yes, I do have videos on using iPad for music. They are not uh, videos on YouTube, perfectly edited. They are a set of Instagram stories that I've done to show um, one particular app that I use for score. I will put a link to that in the description of this Facebook Live and on the website. Okay, thank you very much. Let me know if you like this uh, topic, if you would like many topics like that. As always, I'm very happy to accept suggestions of what you would like to hear about in the future, like the episodes coming up about releasing the tensions and avoid injury. Share this episode with your helping friends if you think that it will be useful for them, and I will see you next week. Take care. Bye.